in a person's actions or in a person's beliefs or a person's doings, then one has to advise. And the way to advise, like I've mentioned before, in the previous sermons, the way to advise is to pull the person aside and to advise him in private and to highlight his mistakes to him in private. And this is the way of hikmah. This is the way of wisdom. Our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at all costs, right? To explain to his companions and left behind a legacy in which we will notice the preservation of brotherhood. This particular brotherhood is of vital importance to our community. Why so? Because the minute there is friction and splits and disagreements amongst us, then it draws us apart. It weakens us as a community. It weakens us as an, as, as an ummah. And it weakens us even more if we see our scholars divide. It weakens us even more if our scholars divide. And when we look at our scholars and we admire them and we, and we look at them and we revere them and respect them, it hurts us as a community to see that they fall into disrepute. To see them, to see their relationships uh, withering away. And this is something which we have to try at all costs to maintain and prevail amongst ourselves. Our beloved Prophet wasallam advised us in his actions and it's recorded in the books of Hadith. He was of the most silent of people. Rasul wasallam tried to convey this particular message of silence over to his companions. Once there was a disagreement amongst the companions. And this was at a very vital point. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa was about to set off to fight the mushrikun in the battle of Uhud. And you all know the significance of this great battle of Uhud in Islam. Our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa drew his companions together in the mosque and he saw their advice. But the companions they were in two groups. They were divided in two groups. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Advise me, what shall I do? The mushrikun are days away from Medina. They are practically on the borders of Medina and are putting our and are putting and is putting the entire city at risk. We have family. We have women and children, we've got the elderly here to protect. What shall we do? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's decision was, let us stay in Medina. Let us protect the city within. Let us guard the walls of Medina and set arches on the borders of Medina and fight the enemy off. It was his decision. This was his decision. But the majority of the companions, they decided, no, we are Rasulullah. Let us go out and meet the enemy. Let us show that we have tawakkul on Allah. We are brave enough to take them, even though they are coming in the thousands, 3,000 strong. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa is in a predicament. He looks at his, com at his companions and he sees this division among them. He's on the party, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that prefers to stay within the boundaries of Medina and protect the community within, which is a very good decision. It's a decision of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and what makes it more stronger is that our beloved Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had a dream just before that particular discussion with the companions. And the dream was that Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is going to be fortified by two shields. And his interpretation of these two shields was the borders and the boundaries and the walls of Medina. Why shall I leave? The companions urged him, Ya Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah, let us go out. Let us face the enemy. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered in silence. He couldn't remember. 
because of the wind, but he entered into his house. And the companions, they were witnessing this. He went into his house and he came out with his shield and his armor and his sword. And the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, we didn't mean to force you to go out to Medina and to face the enemy outside of Medina. We didn't intend to do this to you, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, no. When a messenger has put on his armor to face his enemy, he does not take it off. Rasulullah did not put up an argument with his companions. He accepted their opinion. The opinion that they, that they came up with, this is the opinion that Rasulullah accepted. And without any argumentation, Rasulullah said, no, I'm siding with the majority, and that is we meet the, we meet the enemy outside Medina. This is the akhlaq of Rasulullah when it comes in uh, situations of dire extremity where decisions of uh, a high caliber has to be taken. Rasulullah decides not to put up an argument, but rather Rasulullah accepts the opinion of his companions. This is the akhlaq of Rasulullah Rasulullah urges us to stay away from anything that brings us to the level of opening a debate, a public debate of an own argument. Like I said, our topic today is the topic of the argumentation that happens between scholars. When is it necessary to argue? When is it necessary to debate on a particular topic? We've mentioned this, that when a person sees, or an alim sees, or a scholar sees, that another has erred in a matter of aqidah and is absolutely certain about this or in his sharia, in his actions, then it is incumbent of him to rectify him. It's incumbent of him to rectify him in private. And this is the adam of the sharia, to advise him in private. Our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us many examples. We have mentioned before the example which is very, very vital and very important to think about. And that is the example of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he was in this particular situation where the mushrikun were highlighting all of his previous thoughts. Subhanallah. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was listening to them highlighting his faults one after the other. But in reality, there was no faults. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again with his actions showed us how to behave in a situation where there is an opposition, a party that has a disagreement with one's actions or one's words, how to behave in such a situation. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept his peace. He kept his silence. Until Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu could not take it anymore. And he started opening his mouth in defense of himself. Which is obviously, it is right, it is how. This is how anybody would think today. This is his hub, but rather the superior, the superior akhlaq and the superior character is to keep one's peace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he knows one's state and what one does in private or in public, or what one has within oneself of akhlaq, inner akhlaq, this is enough. It's enough what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about oneself. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu stood up in defense of himself. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up. Ya Abu, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, why have you stood up? These people have been attacking me and highlighting my faults. Ya Rasulullah said, No, Ya Abu Bakr, when you were silent, the angels were defending you. The Malaika to Rahman were defending you. And when you open your mouth, Shaitan said it. Now when a person counter argues and tries to stop and defend, then this is when the door of argumentation opens. And when the door of argumentation opens, when what the ulama 
say when there is iqama al hujja bil hujja, when one gives his proof and the other one gives his proof why he said so, and the other one said, well, I said so, and this is my reasons why. This is the time when there's a crossfire. And when there's a crossfire between brothers or even between scholars, then it builds up barriers between them. <coughs> it's like the Uliya used to say, befriend whoever you want. Befriend whoever you want. Shake the hand, greet whoever you want, send a gift to whoever you want, and if you want to stop that friendship, open an argument with your brother. You break that friendship immediately. And this is something which Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tried to prevent amongst his companions. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once walking in Medina. And he saw his companions in a heated debate, in an argument. And how did it happen? It happened because of the enemy of Islam came in between them. It's a debate between the Ansar, a group that after bitter fighting and bloodshed for many years, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought their hearts together. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made unity among them. But this particular unity was not good for a particular people in Medina. And that was the Yahud. The Yahud found it very uh, annoying to see that the Ansar, the Aus and the Hazrat are now sitting together on a round circle and discussing and greeting one another and living a happy life in Medina. Before it wasn't like that. Before they used to fight continuously. And who was the ones who provided the, provided the armor and the ammunition uh, for this particular fight between these two uh, brothers? It was the Yahud. They said, we are losing out on this particular unity. We are losing out because these two are not buying and purchasing from us any more weapons. Let's sow the seeds of this unity among them. They came and they reminded them about the old days. Can you remember? So and so of the Hazraj murdered your brother. And they went to the Aus, to the Aus and said, you know, uh, to the Hazraj and said, oh, so and so of the Hazraj. So and so of the Aus murdered your father. Can you remember? Right. What does this bring? It brings in hatred, old ill feelings. And this is one of the seeds of argumentation. This is one of the seeds of argumentation. All in feelings that we that we uh, host within ourselves, that we need to try, try to forget about. So they started arguing. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walked past them and saw them in a heated debate and argumentation. And they fought and they exchanged words that were very, very bad. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came among them and said, O oh, the Ansar, why does this unity when your beloved Rasul is still amongst your midst? Why does this unity? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tried to stop it and eventually it calmed down. They sought repentance and they begged the forgiveness of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The point is, when there is hatred amongst one another, these are one of the main sources of argumentation. So the main reasons why an argumentation happened between one another. Imam Ghazali, he highlights, he says, when people have takabu, arrogance, Tarafur, he says, Tarafur meaning the person feels he's superior upon the other or he wants to expose his knowledge or he wants to show his merit upon the other. These are all the things that sparks argumentation, that sparks disagreement among one another. If a person knows that it's a possibility for me to be wrong and a possibility for so-and-so to be right. Let me rather not argue. 
The approach of Imam Abu Hanifa is they are right with a possibility of being wrong. And we are wrong with a possibility of being right. This particular approach brought the Imam to a level that no Imam ever reached in his ishtihad. If you look at how he approached the conditions of disagreement, Sayyidina Imam Abu Hanifa was also of an extraordinary level of Ra'i. He used his mental capacity to a very high degree. Let us recall one particular incident when there was a disagreement between scholars in his time. And they argued about the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine speech created or is it not created? It's not an arguing. Now we know in the time of Imam Abu Hanifa there was great disagreement upon this particular topic. The scholars were divided amongst one another. The Sunnis on the one side and the Mu'tazilites on the, one, on the other side. So two individuals were brought to Imam Abu Hanifa and it was said to him, these to argue on the topic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine speech. What do we do? Who's the mutabi'ah? Who is the one who innovates? He said, don't pray behind both of them. Don't pray, meaning if you pray behind, if, if you want to pray, you have to know that is my imam a mutabi'ah or not? Is he an innovator or not? He said, don't pray behind both of them. <coughs> ya Imam Abu Hanifa, we understand the one who says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine speech is created. We know this is a mutadiyah, but why this one? He says, it's not created. He said, because he argues in matters of the deen. He argues in matters of the deen. Certain individuals are liable to take on argumentation to protect our deen. But they themselves need to know how to go about it. How to address the topic. We have seen debates between scholars on television and sometimes we see it in public. And these debates that happen, it happens with a certain etiquette. There has to be a certain etiquette present when these debates take place. It shouldn't be done because to be little party. The one who disagrees or the one who is at fault is not there to be little the party, but to highlight the fault and say this particular fault or this particular belief or this particular action is wrong. And this is what we are addressing. But not to become personal. This is not the way in which we address our disagreements. Imam Al-Ghazali says, reasons why people disagree and debate are because of the arrogance, because of them ex wanting to expose their knowledge or to sow their merit or to highlight the inferiority of the party they are debating. But there's a second reason as well, and this is more vicious, and that is that certain people have a tendency to behave like predators. Imam al Ghazali highlights this and they says, this is sab'iyya, sab'iyya, certain people has the tendency to behave like predators. And we find this among certain, amongst certain Muslims in our community. The minute they see somebody walking, for example, with a tasbih, they pounce on him. Why a tasbih? What's wrong with your fingers? There's no reason for that. Right? They might see somebody, for example, doing a particular action in his salah. And they pounce on him. Why do you do this in your salah? Why do you behave like that? Is it like us? Not with the intention to educate himself or to advise the person that that is wrong. If it is wrong, the question is. 
So Imam Ghazali highlights a very important point and he says, one of the reasons why people end up in debate on matters of the deen, especially and belief, is because of sabaiya. We find certain groups in our community that feel that they are the only people that will enter into Jannah. And when they believe like this, they are making themselves a sect. They're making themselves a sect. This is incorrect. But rather, we have to give people the benefit of the doubt. There are certain people in our community that feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in human form. And if we don't believe like this, we are out of the fold of Islam. These are people that are making themselves a sect. When they see their fellow Muslims act in a certain way, for example, celebrating the Milad of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they feel the urgency to pounce on them, to rectify them, to change their mentality. This is of the lower desires of the South, Imam Ghazali says, and it needs to be treated. It comes from the internal desires of the kabu, which is a very, very serious disease of the soul. And it comes from the internal disease of, uh, of ghadab, of anger, and feeling one is superior over others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us to a state of humbleness and May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us uh, accept the differences amongst us on condition that the differences don't lead to uh, incorrect behavior in terms of aqidah and uh, uh, sharia. If so, then we have to approach it in the way Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam approached the disagreements he had in his time amongst himself and his opposition. Alhamdulillah.